Today's episode of Mark Who 42's Hooniverse is brought to you by Audible.com. You get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Mark Who 42. There are over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, you lucky guys. That's www.audibletrial.com slash Marku42. And now, here's the show. Hello, I'm John St. John, best known as the voice of Duke Nukem, and you're listening to Marku42. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of Marku 42. Uh, I am uh, Patty Hawkins, filling in for our esteemed reader, Mark Barndon. Joined here today by... Iggy Matthews from Let's Be Real. How's it going? Uh, I am good, young lady. I am good. And uh, it's going to be just the uh, terrible twosome of the two of us. Mark and Christian are away on assignment at the Claremont Comic Con, and uh, it's going to be just you and me for this Thanksgiving Day edition of Marku 42, take to the Hooniverse and Beyonds and something with pilgrims and Indians and and gobbles and yes. gobbles and uh, <laughs> oh, what's the point? Thanksgiving was, was absorbed by the greater Christmas, like about like at least seven eight years ago. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I already uh, took advantage of the uh, Target specials. Everything was on three dollars, so couldn't help myself. I haven't even looked. Or then again, I've already got too much like nonsense to begin with. <laughs> but, honestly, I think I think Thanksgiving got lost really to me. It was weird because I never really was into it as a kid. I kind of appreciated it. The bigger Christmas got, the more I began to appreciate Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think it was about five, six years ago when, and I usually don't get up early enough to catch it, but I happened to catch up and I started watching the Macy's Parade. And I love yes, it. I love a good parade. And then about five years ago, I noticed the whole damn thing was now a Christmas parade. And I, yes. remember, and I just remember growing up, like, no, there was none of that. It was just like the marching bands and everything else. And the only Christmas thing was at the very end with Santa, which I Santa, thought was cool. Yep. And very now good. it's it's like, what's the point to Santa? Santa should probably go first now. Probably. Yeah, I didn't really like enjoy Thanksgiving so much. It was like growing up, Thanksgiving parade is playing on the TV and mom is playing some sort of like Latino, Puerto Rican uh, Christmassy music. So I just kind of stayed away from everything until the very end. That's now, the important stuff. Now, right this there. is, this is uh, like I said, I'm mean, in Florida, so uh, I'm like, I'm like an honorary Puerto Rican by uh, by default with all my friends. My proxy, <laughs> yeah, pretty much that and that and I'm, I I have, I have a tether to. With South Florida, it's like okay, you're you by proxy become partial Puerto Rican and partial Jewish. Cuban, um, Cuban was all Miami, and I was in Broward. You know, so the yeah, Cubanos and everything else. Was, so Mark might have a little proxy by a Cuban in him uh, because he's so close to down there. So did you do like the, the traditional like like turkey and mashed potato stuff or did you have a Puerto Rican flavor to it? OK, so there was like a turkey and mm-hmm. then it was like rice and beans and um, like we have this mofongo stuff. So it's like plantains all mashed up. That was <laughs> mofongo our <mashed> stuff. <laughs> mofongo stuff. Yeah, that's what it's called. I don't know. It's just like a, you got tostones and you got like all this bread with like stuff on it and all this thing. And then, yeah, you have like mashed potatoes and stuff that probably somebody else brought. A white person brought it. It was not bad. So com- <laughs> I was so completely eat at a restaurant called Mafungo Stuff. Mafungo Stuff. Like that sounds terrible. I'm going in. <laughs> that would get all the hipsters here. That sounds awful. We must try it. So, ugh. <laughs> So many tag ins like D- enjoy lovely food at Mofungo stuff, you know. Look at this Mofungo stuff right here. Uh, it just sinks, melts in your mouth. Yeah, that's so, your hand. Uh, um, so, other, oh, uh, and also, uh, since this is our Thanksgiving Day tradition, uh, Comedy Central is bringing back uh, the Turkey Day Mystery Science Theater Marathon. Yes, it's gonna be great. 
going to be great. Yeah, right now, like, they let two comedians in charge of Mark 42. They have made a terrible mistake. Oh, yeah, dear God. They, they might have. They, <laughs> <laughs> they very well might have. The interesting thing about the, uh, the Mr. Science Theater thing is that it's segueing into the new version. They had that Kickstarter about a year and a half ago. Joel finally just said, oh, to heck with it. Uh, put up a Kickstarter, and it did monster. I think it raised, like, uh, like $2 million or something. So he's actually producing 13 new episodes. And he's doing, not a bait and switch, but he's doing a Doctor Who thing where it's not going to be him. It's going to be a new comedian and a new mad scientist, a basically new cast. He's going to be behind the scenes writing it. But uh, and he, he compared it to Doctor Who where he said, hey, you know, it's like it's like a new Doctor Who. man." So, so. and I, I've met I met Joel a couple of times at conventions and he really is just a really cool and awesome guy. So um, I'm mildly looking forward to some of the previews from that. So, yeah. It's not like we're getting a Doctor Who Thanksgiving special or anything like that. You know? That would be cool. That would that would be interesting. Like, get as much. Like, let's find excuses. You know how we find excuses for days off and not go to school. Let's find excuses to have like special Doctor Who episodes. Just, just a little short film or something. Something like that. Something. Oh, and uh, before we get into the regular news, uh, let's, let's talk about what I call the elephant in the room. Uh, this week, and I know not everybody did this, so what we're going to do is we're going to break this down in little chunks. Uh, the Power mm. of the Daleks was shown as one big chunk as part of the Fathom films. Uh, I, I went and saw it. I know Mark Christian did, but uh, we decided that we would just maybe do it like a sort of an episode at a time for our viewers out there because yeah it's quite a bit yeah and we're and we're already doing that with, with class too so we we, we don't want to like lay everybody down with oh, i haven't seen it yet you know but it's uh, a spoiler man yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen it and for any of our new foo fans out there uh and just in case you don't know, um, it, what they did was Power of the Daleks is one of Patrick Troughton's uh, lost stories. These were stories that the BBC just wiped out because they just didn't think any of this stuff will be worth a, a third viewing. I think they showed it twice. And not just Doctor Who either, although everybody harps about the Doctor Who stuff. There's a ton of classic British television that was just literally erased and thrown away and whatever. So what they've done is, and they've done this in Triplings before, they did this with uh, The Invasion, the Cyberman story, where they animated the original scenes using the recordings of the original soundtrack, which still mm -hmm. existed by fans. Fans actually held up reel-to-reel -reel recorders and recorded these episodes, which is how, if you Way want, to go, fans! I know! Heck yeah! Now, I always made it a point that I, even though these existed and you can purchase the lost episodes in audio form, I've always said I will never listen to them. I want to watch them in some form. And I finally got that chance with Power of the Daleks. And the thing about Power of the Daleks is so very prevalent. One, it was not only Trouton's debut episode, but y'all got to remember, it was the debut of a brand new doctor from the existing doctor and this was the huge huge gamble that the bbc took you know for those of you who saw Avengers of space and time the uh sort of hartnell biopic uh understand that his health wasn't very good his mental acuity was fading mm. and so and they just decided well he's an alien maybe he can just get a new body and and again this was what could go wrong yeah really and they they didn't they didn't know quite how, how this would fly over and so to stack the deck they brought the daleks back then that's what it happens they immediately throw them into and i get some of the curious things too is uh in this first episode right in the opening scene when he rejuvenates as he recalls it it's not regeneration yet there's a lot of the standard tropes that we've come to see with a brand new companion meaning the companions pen and polly look at him very suspiciously he's acting a little loopy which is fine but he settles into it uh i'm a little bored now where they 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 drag out it seems like the, the entire first episode of a doctor's new regeneration mm. is just a bit they did this with smith and capaldi where it's too much where he's not quite right and odd or whatever it's like okay let's you could do it for the first act, but by the middle of the second act, like put him in whatever clothes he's going to be wearing the rest of the season and just have him start, you know, you know, kicking bug eyed monsters in the butt. <laughs> yep. That's just what I like myself. Well, I mean, it always it always looks like like the whole pay no attention to the man behind the curtain as we try to seg you into a new everything. <laughs> And that's, I, well, it, 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 here's the curious thing about it. Back then, it kind of was, because it really was, all right, all right he's a little loopy, but uh, okay, let's put him in charge, and let's shove them into a sit immediate situation 
which they'll stop worrying about because they're like, are, are you the doctor? Is he the doctor? Well, if you're the doctor, then, oh, here's the doctor's ring. Put it on. And then he puts it on. It slides right off. It's like, ah, all right, you're not the doctor. And the doctor's like, I'd like to see a butterfly go back into his chrysalis case after it spread its wings. <laughs> <laughs> And 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 here's, here's and here's an interesting thing too is that Trump you could tell there's a sharp intellect behind it, and in some ways there's a little bit of a mystery too. And uh, if you continue to watch it later on, you'll get this later that uh, he's not quite the uh, clown that he appears, and he's almost got a Sylvester McCoy esque. Um, Oh wait a minute! There is there is something beneath the surface there. That's that he's the he looks one step behind everybody, but really he's two steps ahead. And uh, it's ha, uh, jokes on you. Yeah, and the and the animation is is a little clunky, but that's okay. So is the original episode. Uh, so is the doctor Again, though. The doctor's yeah. always been a little clunky, you know. And and this yeah, I remember, and I remember too. This is a classic story. So it's 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 twenty two minute chunks and ends on this pseudo cliffhanger, and then it goes on. So watching it in one big chunk is not daunting, but uh, it was there's lots of scenes that that tend to repeat themselves, and lots of dialogue. But it's a Dalek story. It's kind of a little bit of a spookier Dalek story because they're not overt menaces. They have to pretend to be on the side of the humans at the beginning. But of course, you know, they're up to no good. And uh, and that's, I'll leave it at that because here, here's the other weird bit too. Watching it in one big chunk, I couldn't really tell when the individual episode ended and the next one sort of began uh, because it was edited together a little seamlessly. But uh, definitely kudos to the the BBC for throwing the money in and doing this, um, and kudos to the animators too. Because here's one thing: if you watch it, that y'all need to understand, they designed this in black and white, and y'all don't realize how hard that is to deliberately make something in black and white with the shading and the grays and everything else. Ooh, it's, yep. it's it's harder than in color. In color, you just click and boom and click and boom. And with all the grays and everything else, it's like they really had to make some long, drawn-out cognitive choices and artistic choices. And yeah, it's not just a setting on the computer going, all right, it's great, now click the black and white setting. Yeah, Perfect. I mean, yeah, you, you Photoshop, you can click it on black and white or whatever. It's like, like no, they... they it's not they, Instagram. Yeah, they it wasn't it was like they did it in color and then just like flip the switch and turn it to black and white. No, they chose the blacks and the grays and the shading on the faces and everything on else. Thank you, graphic designers, for yeah. your very hard work. And they they using the few stills and the slight snippets of footage uh, remaining from the episode, they reconstructed it and uh, and they did do a little bit of a George Lucas special edition and some scenes. They went ahead and they freely admitted that you know what we kind of jazz this scene up in one of the future episodes uh not much of a spoiler but the the daleks are, are are replicating themselves so you see a dalek assembly line and watching it and i'm like there is no way in hell this looked this good in the original no way in hell and uh and they, they freely admit it so if you haven't seen this by all means check it out if you're a classic fan this is like the biggest thing since the 50th anniversary for us if you're a new who fan Watch, at least, again, same thing with Unearthly Child that I always, like, sputter on about when we talk about uh, uh, translating people into, under, into understanding, not maybe not necessarily loving Classic Who, at least watch the first episode, and then come back and watch the last episode, and watch mm -hmm. all this, because <laughs> there's, there's a lot of monotony in the middle, I'm not gonna lie about that, but that was what Who was, and the weekly installments, and bringing you back up to date. Who's this character? And who's this character? Oh, for those of you just joining us, this character. Because remember too, TV back then, especially episodic TV, there was no DVRs. There was no VCRs. There was no download. No, you okay? actually had to be a responsible adult and arrive on time. That's right. You had, to, <laughs> you had to watch it. And if you missed it, you tuned on in. Well, then there were certain bits and parts of the plot that had to be reestablished for those of you joining us. So. If you had friends with common interest, they should have had your back. Mm-hmm. That's a date. So, Power of the Daleks, uh, that, that's my uh, my short version, which turned out to be quite long. But anyway, um, <laughs> thank you, my dear. Uh, what, what other kind of news we got to go over with? Okay, well, today's news is sponsored by Mark Who 42. Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. Have you? 
Yeah. Have you? I don't know, man. Well, while we're on the topic of the Hooniverse, the uh, Children in Need charity got an exclusive preview to the Christmas special, Return of Dr. Mysterio, during this year's charity evening on BBC One. Uh, you can actually catch a clip of that same charity special on our website, marku42.net. Yeah, I don't know about this special. <laughs> I, uh... Wait, you got to see it? No, no, no. I just saw that, that... I saw that clip, and I'm kind of, uh... Ah, yeah. I mean, Doctor Who is definitely taking a whole a very new age spin to it, and I think a lot of fans might be going, you know what? That was a good ride. I'm done. Um, I think it's more tailoring towards the uh, younger generation that's coming in, which is not bad. I mean, I don't, I don't really, like, disagree with it. I don't really say that I have an opinion on it. I guess I'm going to ho- watch this whole thing and see how it goes, but I definitely found that to be interesting. I'm like, superhero? Hmm. Okay. I don't know. I, I but right after I saw it, I, I wrote the boss. I wrote this prediction, which is basically like, Okay, here's here's how I'm willing to bet. And again, this is all my own postulations, so you can't really call it a spoiler because I don't know. But my prediction is this. Uh, the superhero guy found some alien technology, didn't really quite understand it, and decided to become a real-life superhero. Yay! But the doctor, of course, recognizes it and says... And rained on his parade. Pretty Good much. Doctor. So the, doc- the doctor's going to say, <laughs> you can't be using this because this technology is either A, it's like killing him a little bit every time he uses it or b if he keeps using it eventually it will release a signal that opens up a portal to an alien invading race and of course the guy will be like no 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 i i i I like being a superhero and you're wrong and the super suit obeys only me and i can do good (laughs) deeds of this and then then at the end it does kind of almost happen and then the doctor kind of saves him and then they destroy the suit and then the doctor gets a big speech about hey you know you don't need to be a superhero you just need to be a hero with a good heart and i ought to know because i oh the typical speech okay why don't you put your fist on your hips spread your legs shoulder width apart throw your chin up to the air and say the whole thing again and then and then (laughs) and then the guy in his civilian identity you know it's like hooks up with that one snoopy reporter chick who's you know obviously you know like a kind of a lot lois lane type so that's my christmas uh, episode prediction um I would be delighted if I am wrong. Um, actually, I do have the summary of Return of Doctor Mysterio. You'd be surprised how dead on you are. Oh, um, <laughs> the Doctor joins forces with an investigative journalist played by Charity Wakefield. The two team up with the New York superhero to snuff out the ever increasing deadly alien threat. So I'm assuming that they team up with this guy only to find out. Wait a minute. You've been using this stuff too? So we can't get rid of it because you're still using it? You're fired. You're fired. Get out of here. Yeah, I, that's, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, okay, again, this is, I'm not saying this is not going to be entertaining or anything like that, but this is, yeah, this, this is what I'm... Hey, who said it had to be realistic to be entertaining? I mean, t- take the uh, Fast and the Furious movies, completely unrealistic, but extremely entertaining. That's what it's I for. I wouldn't know. I have never seen any of them. But it's here's okay, the deal. Never... Here's the deal. I've, I've, always, I've, always, I've always talked about possibly marathoning them. Oh, gosh. You're going yeah, like, to break I ran my your film face blog, on a brick wall. <laughs> back when I ran my film blog, I, I literally thought, you know what? Maybe I'll do a Fast and the Furious marathon and do like a video blog of it while I'm doing it and make a gag about how I'm getting stupider and stupider or something. But I, 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 then I thought, no, that's that's a snarky. And um, if I ever do it, I'll legitimately review them with an open mind and stuff. But uh, Well, I'll, I mean, uh, have you ever played uh, Grand Theft Auto? No. No? no. Closest, um, closest I ever got was uh, their uh, uh, was it Rockstar Games. I played uh, Red Dead Redemption, mostly because a, a friend of mine actually played uh, the one of the villains in it. But then I like, got hooked on it and said, like, oh, this is a pretty good game. Yeah, no, just play Grand Theft Auto when you got the basic gist of Fast and the Furious. You're good. Uh, so Vin Diesel, like, like sleeps with hookers and shoots them? Not him. Uh, what is okay. it? Um... Paul Walker? Oh, really? Oh, the, the guy who passed <laughs> the away? The undercover cop did it, not not the actual criminal. It was the undercover cop. Oh, okay. And then, of course, <laughs> then of course, that was the movie that uh, gave us Wonder Woman. Uh, I'm actually excited for this Wonder Woman and Aquaman, especially Aquaman. I'm very excited for that one. But let's see. We're starting I think to, your reasons for being excited and my reasons for being excited <laughs> might be different. But that's okay. C'est la vie. So, all right. Uh, 
What else, what else we got on deck? All right. Uh, BBC Worldwide North America has recently announced their plans on airing the Doctor Who Christmas special Return of Doctor Mysterio on the big screen throughout the United States. Uh, right now we have two confirmed dates in time of showing. It's going to be showing on the 27th and on the 29th of December at 7 p.m. Now, I don't know if it's like, you know, simultaneously all over the United States. It's going to be at 7 p.m. precisely. And we're going by time zones here. But I'm, I was like, okay, that's very specific for each and every single individual theater that they are participating at. But uh, that's cool. That's usually by individual time zones. Now, they did do that with one of the Matrix sequels, the, the second one and the third one. They did do that as a stunt where it got released at the same exact time regardless of the, of the time zone. So I think it was... It was like midnight New York time, but like nine o'clock the 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 day after the day before uh, in <laughs> L.A. and then and at five a.m. and in, in, in Jill abroad. So oh, that's beautiful. Yes, do that. I don't want them going by seven p.m. at a reasonable time for us. Don't go by time zones. Don't go by time yeah. zones. No, go by seven p.m. UK time, please. Everybody's gonna be so bad. We'll find out who the real fans are. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's it says I I think I'll just watch it on my TV at home on Christmas. I think I'll I, just use when my I get DVR. home from work because I always work on Christmas. <laughs> That's the job of Disney, unfortunately. Uh, the theater version will include extra features such as the making of Doctor Mysterio, as well as a special inside look at the modern hero concept. So, so that right there, modern hero concept. What what do you have to say about that, Patty? Comes to mind. Uh, wow. Uh, it sounds like they're trying to go after the superhero money. I don't know. I mean, it almost sounds like this is a concept that they're trying to keep. Like, they put a lot of work into this, and it's like, uh, we want to kind of bring this guy back, like, a lot and use him throughout uh, the year. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I mean, when, when Marvel uh, had the comic rights to Doctor Who, they never really crossed him over in the Marvel Universe, and I thank God for that every day. <laughs> Because they could have, they could, they 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 absolutely could have, but they they chose not to. And the I companion would constantly be wearing spandex, uh, bubble butt. Yeah, I yeah yeah. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. It's it's like I said, I, I, I'm pretty trepidatious about this Christmas special. But I'll say this much: I was trepidatious about last year's because the minute I hear the words "River's Song," I walk away. But. <gasps> But but this was the greatest River Song story ever because she finally you know let's say she finally put away her Mary Sue shoes and she was an equal and it was legitimately fun seeing the Doctor you know play dumb against the character that thought they knew it all and yep, yep and it yep. was and it was it was a it was a it was a happy ending for both of them and yes and I and to be honest I've kind of said that. I really think that story could have been and maybe should have been Capaldi's maybe second to last story. Well, uh, speaking of second to last story, this month we're celebrating the second Doctor. Back in 1966, the Doctor Who series took its memorable leap of faith, changing the lead actor from William Hartnell and essentially pa passing up the torch. This, uh, though incredibly risky, proved to be an unbelievably successful uh, feet as we now celebrate 50 years of regeneration 50 years of regeneration i mean i would love that to have a celebration like that i mean 50 of course, years again, like i said earlier that's like really wrong because they didn't call it regeneration until later on in the third doctor so okay really, you know that comes needs the nerd. to be that needs to really start with uh start from robot uh, uh, baker's first story <laughs> so that's just Boy, what a row that sure is. Oh, you know, man. You see, they didn't spend the more time. Fired up. They didn't spend more time on Wikipedia. That's all I got to say. Mm, <laughs> technicality says that you're wrong about everything. So. <laughs> 50 years uh, of regeneration. <laughs> 50 years. Okay. 1966. See, that's, that's why you come here, folks, because we've got the real know-how about Dr. Who. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, at the time it wasn't called the regeneration. We call it 50 years of regeneration because we ended up coming with, with a proper term. And well, uh, this was the start of it. So we just backtrack it, clear out, wide out the information. That's like tracking it. down the guy who like invented the wheel and then saying it's the thousand year anniversary of the automobile. You know what? <laughs> I'm going to take you out back. I'm going to beat you with my chancla. <laughs> Oh, all right. So 
um, my final segment here is um, we're going to go a reach beyond the, the news. Um, so tune into Mark 42 as our host, Mark Baumgarten, challenges myself as well as Christian Dropout Basil in our fun filled segment. Glasses in session. As re- we're going to review each episode in kind of like a pop quiz fashion. Uh, who's going to get the dunce hat next? Probably Christian, but you're going to have to tune in to find out because this, this is actually Patrick's favorite show, isn't it? Isn't uh, just... No, I again. You're I, like the number one fan. You're, like, you're I, the biggest fangirl. I uh, watched the uh, first two episodes and I decided that I really didn't need to see any more. Um, I would actually, I would actually have joined you guys on this, but honestly, I did, I didn't want to be, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be the harsh, like downer sort of guy. So honestly, the short version is that I thought, <laughs> I thought, th- honestly, I think class has, has tremendous potential, but, um, there, maybe not with children. No, there's, there's, there's <laughs> hey, really, you know really what it boils down to, well, well, no, what it boils down to, if I, quite frankly, is that, and this is, this is the problem with shows that, that take place in a centralized location, and the location is actually... The, so the, the school is really the focus of that. And it's like, okay, I'm having difficulty believing that two or three people in each episode die, and by the fourth or fifth person who disappears, including students, that it isn't a big to-do. Like, the government is... Or at least, at least the government, or Torchwood, or Unit, or somebody doesn't step Yeah, they're on really in. not advertising London as a wonderful place to live in. You know, I'm like, the police does not give a crap about you. Oh, my God. This- I mean, they... they, 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 they <laughs> They did say in the first episode that the that the place is is a central node point of weirds going on and stuff. But uh, yeah, oh, and, and how, how many and how and how and how many times is the is another teacher going to be doing shenanigans or another student going to be revealed to be this and teacher doing shenanigans in London versus a teacher doing shenanigans in the United States? Two completely different things. Yeah, but uh, again, because there's, there's a certain point where it can only happen so many times for me to just be uh, all right this this it breaks my credulity uh and that's like okay i just can't by the by the second episode and i was just like all right if a, another student has died and, and all this other stuff's going on and and parents are wigging out and there isn't like and we all know the british tabloid press you know it's like loves you know yes and they shit. love to exaggerate you know, and, like they, they did, and they they are responsible for disappearance of own child actually i'm not why aren't you responsible for this child's so technicality my statement is correct yeah all you ever see in the background is is, may, is maybe a flyer say, saying missing child whatever which looks like it's which been, nobody like, cares about yeah nobody exactly cares. even the students it is yeah everybody's they're pretty, just like oh look i have a stain on my shirt let me grab this missing flyer and wipe it off pretty oh, much God. yeah everybody's everybody's <laughs> really kind of callous in the show too so i, I just i i almost i almost thought it was the show was kind of irresponsible i mean um i again i i, I get the characters i liked the caveat of at first, they imply that the alien characters looked normal, but then they're the super brief, real flashback of the flashback, the, the true flashback within, a, within the fake flashback, where you're like, okay, no, they're very alien esque aliens and they don't look human at all. I, I did enjoy that. No, all the pieces were in place for it to be a, a thoroughly enjoyable show. I, I just think that um, it's just not for me. But then again, I'm a 48 year old guy, and class is meant for young viewers and young adults and everything else so and that's the other reason too why i sort of recuse myself holy crap you're 20 years older than me (laughs) wow that is the news folks that right there is the news so yeah i didn't uh, (laughs) so yeah so i just uh yeah so it's it's not it's not for me so when something when i know for sure something is absolutely not meant for me then I feel damn silly criticizing it or going on to it, which I know I've just done for the past five minutes. But, you know, it's, that's not my point. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, the first episode, oh, when, when the doctor showed up and kicked ass, that was pretty amazing. That was awesome. That was so awesome. But I really, you know, like, I think back on that now and it kind of makes me mad a little bit because I'm like, you guys just literally did this so I would take a seat on your bleachers and watch this happen. You know, I'm like, oh, the doctor. Here, yay! Yeah, everything everything was going great. Then they had to stop and look at the wall and see Clara's name, and I was like, "Damn it! Damn it! Damn it!" <laughs> Why 
Oh, yeah. No. And it's just like, okay, well, we're probably never going to see the doctor again. It's just going to be implied. Uh, We might actually see the TARDIS more so than we see the doctor. I guess that's how they put implications that the doctor was here. Yeah, I thought having him on the phone, I thought was a little bit of a a cheat. I I would have rather the doctor just came in sort of sideways and just he he walked in that scene just like, you know, it's just have a good time. The TARDIS on my way to this resort planet and then all of a sudden these signals start flaring. I thought I'd come in and check this out. Look what I find here. And then, you know, mm-hmm. so, but it yep. was, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a good, you know what it was? It was a good day. De- it was a decent debut episode, but the second episode, just uh, the, the limitations of it began to, to show. And again, this is all on my scale and what's bad for me could be good for everybody else. And again, like I've, like I've always said, don't take my opinion as a commandment and uh you know don't don't take it personally if i don't like what you like because i try not to take it personally when you don't like what i like and um uh, which i don't oh there that's fine bitch I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the news was brought to you by mark who 42 tune into krypton radio or download our podcast to get the latest doctor who news reviews and interviews everything from the universe and beyond beyond Beyond. Beyond, beyond, beyond. <laughs> Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and our website, markwho42.net. Also, buy our stuff. That's what fans do. Be nice. Buy our stuff. Something Eat your money. like that. Something like that. And uh, speaking of stuff, we're going to take a break because we got to do uh, some more uh, commercials and stuff. But when we get back, uh, the gang is going to talk to John St. John. Um, and the, the name sounds slightly familiar yeah. to old school computer PC gamers. Uh, mm-hmm. He is the voice of Duke Nukem himself. Duke Nukem. That's right. Yes. Come get some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you named it after? Come get some. No, actually, that was a. Duke Duke Nukem, uh, or basically, did, was was a parody character of all the Schwarzenegger uh, mm-hmm. uh, things at the time of the eighties. So he's this big blonde, sunglass wearing, just just blow away aliens, and he's always the epitome of movies. testosterone. Oh, absolutely! He's like it was a complete like like complete joke of it, and it's absolutely hysterical. And he'd go by a microphone, but born to be wild, you know. <laughs> you I came here to kick uh, ass and chew bubble gum, you. and I'm all out of bubble gum. Of course, the line that always strucks me forever will always be, "Damn, those alien bastards booby trapped the sub." Because in that scene, I kept dying over and over and over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we're still alive in the morning. Then we're no, we're not dead. Mm, pretty much, pretty much. All right, so the boys are gonna be like chatting with him, and uh, after that, uh, Iggy will be back with our farewells. But uh, by all means, stick around. Hi, folks. This is Christian Basil, Mark Who Forty Two, and if you've been lucky enough to catch us at conventions and wondered how you could hire us to come to your convention or special event, simply go to Heroes on Hand, click the podcast icon and click the icon for mark who 42 on our page on heroes on hand you can actually click the button that says click here to book more who 42 for your next event and that's all you have to do once again if you want to hire us for your next event simply go to heroes on hand.com click on podcast click on our icon and click the green button to book us for your next event you're gonna love us we'll see you there The voice of Christian Basil, take one. Hi, I'm Christian Basil, and I would like to provide my voice for all your voiceover needs, such as... Okay, like an announcer. Like a what? Like an announcer. For all your voiceover needs, such as animation, radio, announcements, introductions... Now an old man. I can even record voicemail for all the mashuganas that call you. A pirate. And it won't cost you a lot of treasure for any services. Creepy movie voice. Just call 407-761-2679. 407-761-2679. Or email voice of Christian Basil at yahoo.com. Well, how was that? That's a wrap. Hello, I'm Nicholas Briggs, the voice of many monsters on Doctor Who, and executive producer of Big Finish Productions. And I'm pleased to announce that Mark Who 42 books have joined forces with Big Finish to bring you Big Finish Audio. There's this fellow who calls himself the doctor and he says he has saved me and we are in his time machine you all right i think i've broken something what about you yes i'm fine thanks i rather think i broke your fall oh sorry 
Mark Who 42 Books will now offer to bring you the best in Big Finish audio. But why are they here? Hmm? How do you do? I beg your pardon? Oh, no need to. I'm the Doctor, and this is... I am Leela. By all means, please do come out to play, Doctor. I'm waiting for you. To find where Mark Who 42 books will be, go to markwho42.net or on their Facebook site at markwho42. What are you saying? They fizzled in somehow, like the TARDIS? Yeah, transmat from another dimension. The, the, the TARDIS doesn't fizzle. It's more of a... Also go to markwho42.net and download my interview with the team. Your executive producer at Big Finish Productions. Correct. Correct. Is this a quiz? Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. Hello, this is Brina Palencia, voice of CL Phantom Hive. You're listening to Mark Who 42. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. And today... We got a very special guest for you, especially for those of you who know your voiceovers. This gentleman should be somebody you're very familiar with. But let me just introduce him by saying this. Can you do your signature line from your character, sir? I've got balls of steel. Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's John St. John. Uh, you know him better as Duke Nukem. And from Hail to the King, baby. It is beautiful. And the, and the sequel, Duke Nukem Forever. Yeah. Now, i got a question for you, uh, John, for people who may not be familiar with your body of work. Tell, tell us a little bit about your, about your history and how you got into voiceovers. Uh, well, I was a radio broadcaster for 30-some-odd years. And uh, while I was a production director at a radio station in San Diego, I uh, happened to meet Lonnie Manella, who's one of the top casting directors in the industry. She uh, moseyed into my studio one day to, to voice a, an ad for a car dealer that I was producing. And she noticed that I had a particularly a decent range uh, of character voices and asked me if I would be interested in acting in, you know, video games. And this was 1995, by the way. Oh, wow. To which I said, voice acting in video games? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> there's no voice acting in video games. She said, well, there's about to be, and there's this game called Duke Nukem we want to <laughs> have you audition for because I think you'd be right for it. And I laughed like anybody does the first time they hear the words Duke Nukem. <laughs> and uh, so she... Uh, she hooked me up with uh, a, a phone patch conversation with George Broussard, who was in Garland, Texas at the time, mm. and uh, one of the creators of Duke Nukem. And I auditioned, and boom, right there on the spot, he hired me. And uh, the rest is pretty much history. You know, that and now almost 200 games later, here we are, uh, 20 years later. So what's that an average per year for me of uh, 10 games a year? Yeah, that sounds about right. Wow, that is awesome. Now, yeah, dating back, going back to that time frame, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it was even in that period where people's, you know, we had like Super Mario Brothers, the only voice that you heard was bah, 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 when they were jumping and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. And in first person shooters, I think Doom was very big at the time, but there was yeah. no dialogue. Exactly there. So how did you prepare for Duke? What, what, um, what, what did they tell you that you had to be and what prepared you to become this character well, as i recall when we were on the phone with uh, george he said i think if i'm not mistaken his thought behind the the voice was something akin to uh charles bronson i went oh charles bronson you want me to talk like this and and the director lonnie manella said no, no 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 i don't think that's the right direction i think something more akin to dirty harry clint eastwood's dirty harry and i went oh go ahead punk make my day and he said, I like that sound, but Duke is a big steroided dude. And I went, go ahead, make my day. Okay. And he said, there it is right there. That's it. And we, we locked it down and, and boom, took off with it. And so the, uh, the first uh, Duke Nukem 3D game was all of about a three and a half or four hour session. And boom, it was done. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, and I, I, can't, do you, I have a question there, and from, from those of you, give everybody an, a, a detail of Duke himself, because I have a question behind that, and, and his personality as well. Well, he's a misogynistic uh, superhero, 
really. Uh, no superpowers, uh, but he does save all of the Earth's babes from an alien invasion, and he kicks <laughs> alien ass. Uh, you yeah. know, that's when when he doesn't have bubble gum. So, I mean, what else is there to know? He's he's an American hero, for God's sake. So what inspiration did you take from other characters or other actors to form Duke Nukem? You know, to be honest with you, that was uh, among one of the very first games I ever did. So I, I wasn't even in the mine set of inspiration or characters or anything. It was just, oh, that's the right voice? Okay, show me the script, uh, and I'll read the lines. And that was pretty much it. It was just a boring recording session, you know, like like yeah. any other video. It's funny, I, I love those questions in interviews where they go, what was it like working on Counter-Strike? Or what was it like working on Twisted Metal 4? And I always say the same thing, just like working on every other video game, I'm in a studio, <laughs> soundproof, with a microphone and headphones, and I'm reading a script. There's nothing exciting about recording a video game, and there's nothing to differentiate one from the other other than the scripted lines. I, I mean, it, people think it might be an exciting thing. No, it's not. It's it's kind of a boring job, to be honest. No, I've done voiceovers too for other things. Uh, that we, we we I've done something called for uh, Doctor Geek, Doctor Geek's uh -huh. laboratory, and yeah, he hands me a script and he sends me the lines. And I I know what you're saying is because I, I say the lines and I say them in like three or four different ways. I send it back to him and then he edits everything together and then people will actually come up and go hey that was great that must have been exciting uh, i said tell us a little bit about it and i said i was sitting in my room half naked drinking a sprite saying these lines <laughs> exactly and you know what it's funny too because the exciting part is after the game is done right and 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 and, and people you know acknowledge what you've done and and enjoy it or become fans or or you get invited to conventions to meet them that's the exciting part not the recording session well that too and when the final edit has finally come out and the product is out there you only he see the one side you only see the lines say the lines be done you never see the geekdom that is about to start when right. somebody puts <laughs> down the game puts it inserts in their disk drive or puts in in their player or puts it you know and then they start and then they're immersed in this Duke Nukem world. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, I, and I guess I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of fangirling or whatever she's doing. But I'm fangirling because I hear the Duke Nukem voice everywhere I go. I mean, when, you know, I'm having a bad day at work, I can hear Duke in my head <laughs> saying <laughs> something about <laughs> your face, your yeah, ass. Really. You know, what's the difference? Uh, it's really pissed me off. Exactly. I, I think there's a YouTuber recording of just nothing but Duke lines. And I say, I want to put every single one of these on my phone for when <laughs> somebody calls me and that exact person calls, Duke will say something. You know, the, 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 the beauty of an iconic character like that is I don't even have to recite the lines anymore because there are so many different soundboards. All I have to push is a button. Yeah. I've got balls of fail. <laughs> and I can shake the thing and it'll come up with a random... But I better not find this on eBay. See, I don't even have to say the lines anymore. The phone does it for me. Ooh, body massage. <laughs> they even recorded uh... me burping several times. So I don't even have to... You know, I can insult people by just pushing this button... <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that as much as I oh, did. I, I always do. <laughs> I actually, I, 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 I hear certain, if, if I hear the voice in something or in something else, or, I, you know, I'm just perusing YouTube and I type in, you know what, I listen to Duke Nukem. I, I will sit there for hours playing that, and the wife goes completely <laughs> insane. She's yeah. like, you're listening to this guy over and over again. Can you shut him up? I just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's no button to make him stop talking. Exactly. <laughs> It's taking a whiz or something like that is just like and but the thing is, do you think Duke Nukem could be created today in the world that we live in? Do you think if he had his start, would he would he make and survive? I don't know if he would have the impact that he used to because we're so much more politically correct today than we were in the mid nineties. Yeah. Um. So and and besides, you have people like uh, Donald Trump who is is so disrespectful of women. That uh, anybody like it, it, granted, Duke is saving you know the babes of the earth, but at the same time he is a misogynistic kind of prick, and I don't think that would go over well today if you were to release a game like Duke Nukem 3D. No. Well, you had back in the 90s, and we didn't have the political correctness now because we had comedians like Andrew Dice Clay, oh, yeah. um, Sam Kennison, and they opened the door for political incorrectness, but then all of a sudden. 
you know, 10, 15 years later, the, the rain started tightening up to the point where they went into obscurity. Yeah, yeah, we're a bit oversensitive today, if you ask me. I, I, I blame most of it on lawyers, personally. <laughs> Frivolous, stupid lawsuits over nothing. <laughs> the views and opinions mentioned in this food are not those of Mark Who 42 or it's... <laughs> and, and you know what? And you know what? F*** your lawyer, okay? F*** them. <laughs> we don't have one. We can't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you can afford a f***ing bleep button. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Free consultation. That's it, pal. And probably whatever water is happens to be in the water cooler that they haven't refilled at the time. That's probably all we can afford there. <laughs> But yeah, I, I I think to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, I think the reason why Duke survived is because I grew up with him with a bunch of other people who who now believe in a geekdom, and I think he survived because he I don't want to say he gets a pass, but because everybody is strong in such in the character itself that he can survive in a politically incorrect world, and because he does challenge every now and then in a politically incorrect world. And I think uh, what was it? I won't give too much away i don't want to spoil it for anybody but i got to at the end of uh, duke nukem forever something happens to duke in a very very short segment and i'm hoping he does it especially in this election <laughs> if anybody's yeah. figured it out what yeah, i just hey, you said know, you can write in anybody you want and right now i'm encouraging people to write in duke nukem if they can't stand <laughs> either of the candidates if you don't like clinton and you don't like trump go ahead and write in duke nukem I think I think he's just a breath of fresh air, especially for people who probably don't even know the character if they've actually seen him come yeah. out of nowhere. He 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 would be somebody like, well, who's that? You know, he's he he's not he is not something that is politically correct today, and I think people would be geeked him. Yeah, I I think the reason that he's lasted all these years, even with the political correctness of today, is just that Duke is an iconic character. I mean, the the very first first person shooter was a, with a personality. Uh, he kind of cemented him his place in history uh, because the timing was so good. 1996 was the perfect time yeah. to release that game. Now, you've also done work beyond Duke, and you've done Sonic the Hedgehog? Oh, <laughs> well, I was Big the Cat for a, a number Big of the years. Big the Cat. Okay. Yeah. Where are my froggy? You don't look so good, <laughs> buddy. Which is, you know, the stupidest voice I've ever done. And, and it's I, I, I guess fans find it quite entertaining they they think that I hate the Big the Cat character. I don't. I think the character is fine. I hate the voice I did because in the audition process, again, Lonnie Manella, the same casting director who cast me as Duke Nukem, uh, called me one day at work and said, hey, I'm casting for the Sonic the Hedgehog game. You're going to be in it. And I said, well, I need to audition. She goes, no, you're going to be in it. I'm, I'm going to find out <laughs> you're going to be – you're just going to be in it because I need you to be in it. I'm like, okay, gosh, I'll, yeah, I'll take your money. I'll be in it. So um, I get into the studio, and she shows me this picture of this big, fat, purple cat with a fishing pole. And she goes, okay, this is the character I want you to play. It's called Big the Cat. And I said, what kind of voice? She said, just stupid. And I went, a stupid voice? She goes, that's perfect. Do that. And I went, no, no. Let me come up with something else. She goes, no, that was the perfect voice. Do it. And so I've always hated the fact that I did that voice. And, and, and I, I come off as irritated by it because the fans get such a kick out of it. Right. And I just do it to entertain them. Do you yourself have a, a favorite video game? Um, do, you, do you play video games yourself? I'm not as much of a gamer as I am an actor, uh, right. but I've always liked uh, driving and flying games. So like flight simulators, I like those. Uh, Need for Speed and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit, I love those because of the, the technical skill involved in racing and finding the right line and knowing when to brake and accelerate and all that. I find that kind of challenging. When it comes to like first-person shooters, like if it were you know Call of Duty or, or one of those kind, types of games, I, I gave those up way back when my son turned 12 years old because when he turned 12, he started kicking my ass at every game we played. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> yeah, and I found it so discouraging. Now he's 24, <laughs> and, and I haven't really played any of those types of games since then. I get copies of all of the games that you know I, I record, and, and I do pop them into my PS4 or, or into my PC and, and play through a little bit. But I'm really – my hand-eye coordination sucks. I mean, dude, I'm 55, okay? I'm, I, I'm not a kid. No. I'm not a young gamer. I can't even compete with these guys. So I like to play through just to see, you know, what was my vocal performance like? Was it any good? And when I hear a few lines, I'll go, yeah, I guess I did okay on that game. But uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't find that I have enough time to, uh, to play the games and to get 
to be any good at them. You know? No, no, no. I, I, I totally agree with you. When I was growing up, I had a little bit more time when I was going to school and stuff like that, and just yeah. go home. And the, and my games were um, uh, Resident Evil and, and games like that, where you could spend. Out, and, you, and I was always up until like one in the morning. And yeah. That's what sucked the most because when I was playing, I was trying to get through a level, and then at one o five, I finally passed the level. So I had to sit there and go, do I save this game or do I keep going? Because I was at it for three to three hours trying to get through this one thing. <laughs> yeah. And growing up with the with the uh, like the Nintendos and stuff like that, you know, I, I get what you're saying. Even at 55, about like 25, I playing these games and I go left, right, left, right, left, right, <laughs> <laughs> left, right, left, right, up, down, up, down, B, A, B. Why I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've, I've often said that I was either born too early or born too late because uh, keep in mind when Duke Nukem 3D was done, I was 30 years old when I recorded that. So I was a little bit too uh, born too soon to really get in on the, the, the real great video gaming. When I was really involved in playing video games was back when, and see if you remember this system, the TurboGrafx-16. Does that uh, ring any bells? You know, I had... I had I don't remember, but I had something that was two games. It was Pong and it was a racing game. Oh, you yeah. had like uh, the Atari system or something, right? It wasn't even Atari. It was this huge the ColecoVision. Get, you're, you're you're getting warm. I can't even remember the. Uh -huh. My parents couldn't get Atari. They got me something called Fairchild. Uh -huh. <laughs> really oh yeah, yeah. And I, I'm watching everybody else play Atari and getting games and all that stuff. Me, I'm playing. Uh, the the breakout game. I'm like, I'm really getting good at this. Yeah, and it's yeah, like but, they're uh, trying to save ET. I'm like, <laughs> great. <laughs> and see, the height of video gaming for me when I was in the right age range, when I was in my you know late twenties, uh, was when Turbo Graphics 16 came out back in the late 80s. Uh -huh. And uh, that's when I had plenty of time to play. And I did play football and Legendary Axe and a few other cool titles that Turbo Graphics offered. And it was the among the first 16-bit games, you know, back when Nintendo was only 8-bit and kind of crappy. I found it fascinating and played a lot. But then uh, my, my radio career took most of my time. And then I had children, you know, about the time uh, I did Duke Nukem, I had my first child. And that changes everything. You find that you have far less time to, to game when you have children to raise. All right. Or you could just show them and say, hey, just hold this controller right here. <laughs> oh, dude, I, I, my, when my son was eight years old, I had him hitting the space bar, shake it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not especially proud of that, but oh, f*** it, I am proud of <laughs> I was about to say, you should be. <laughs> he's, he's a fine, well-adjusted young man, I'll have you know. And he can outgame everybody, right? Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah? I, I know he games a lot, but I don't know how he does, you know, compared with all of his buddies. I remember the comedian Dennis Miller, he goes, you know, we were spending years trying to find Osama bin Laden. And he goes, nobody has ever gone to my kid, my 15-year-old. Just give him a, a, a drone and one of those uh, video game things, and he'll find him in five <laughs> minutes. And he'll take right. that drone and go right up his, you know. He said, why don't we go that route? We have an untapped source of, you know, we don't have to declare wars anymore. We just have to give a, a, a kid a drone and some panel, and we'll, there will be no more wars anymore because the kids will take over. You know, I'm pretty sure that all of these drone strikes we're doing over in, you know, uh, wherever. I don't want to be specific here, but I'm sure all these drone strikes we're doing, uh, these are all guys who used to play video games, yeah, and I exactly. bet a bunch of them played Duke Nukem. <laughs> and respawning, too. Yeah. <laughs> Now, we're going, uh, we are talking about, um, throughout this uh, year, we've been talking about Star Trek's 50th anniversary, and you got to be on Star Trek Online. Tell us a little bit about that and your role in there. Oh, I've had a, a few uh, uh, minor parts, minor roles, and uh, I guess most notably uh, the Klingon Ambassador Bavat. I play that one, and then uh, a new character that I just recorded recently called Mavek. Mm -hmm. Seems like all Klingon names are one letter apostrophe <laughs> followed by two <laughs> letters, right? Exactly. Mavek. Um, I have not actually played the game, but um, I'm just happy to be in it knowing that you have people like, uh, well, the actor who plays Tuvok, for instance, is actually a voice actor in the game as well. Tim Russ. And yeah. uh, I, I think that's pretty cool. I, I like being a part of a game that has some, you know, some real A-list actors in it. I, I, I think it gives me a little more credibility. <laughs> I think Duke is A-list for me, but that's me. That's just me. <laughs> but, I wish I were an A-list actor. Dude, they make a lot of money. Yes. Speaking of which, what is your geek cred? What What do you like sci-fi and, and fantasy-wise? 
Uh, I was always into Star Trek Next Gen. That was my favorite. I liked Voyager a lot. I was always a Star Trek fan. More Star Trek than Star Wars. Right. As far as sci-fi goes, and, and uh, never a huge Doctor Who fan because because of my age. I think I was too old to get into it when it was at its peak. Mm -hmm. So I kind of missed that boat. But it's come back. It's been revamped. And, and, and... I know, and now I don't have time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> No, I've got plenty of time to watch Shameless. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no time for Doctor Who. No, I've never been a Whovian, I, and I have a lot of friends and fans who love it and go, "Dude, why aren't you watching Doctor Who?" I'm like, <laughs> no, I, I never have. I don't, I don't know how. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, no, it's not how. It's who. <laughs> exactly. But I feel for you because there is so much geekdom out there. There's Star oh, yeah. Trek, Star Wars, Supernatural, uh, Firefly, all that. And people are going, well, uh, since you are a big sci-fi fantasy buff, you should know. I was like, I have never seen that. Mm -hmm. I, I think I got through, I tried to start the geekdom, my, a new geekdom with American Horror Story. And after the third season, I just could not pick it back up again. I, I, and, and, and some of this, some of the new geekdom that's just out there, I just can't get started. Or I try to get started and then... Second episode, oh, I missed the third one, boom, uh, that's it, that's it. Oh, and then you're out, yeah. Did, exactly. did, did you watch Stranger Things? I don't have Netflix. Oh, dude, you got to have I Netflix. I know, I just, I, oh. I, I have regular crappy cable, and i got to admit it, and it's only because it comes with a DVR, and Doctor Who is on BBC America, and I, uh, I got yes. to keep that. Hey, who's your cable provider? Bright House. Who? Bright, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they're actually a nice network over here. They do a lot of local stuff, but uh, Bright House Networks is my cable provider over there. Not that I'm plugging anything. Or... <laughs> but uh, we actually do a couple things with Allison Walker-Torres. She does a lot of articles on um, local conventions that she has. So we have a good relationship with the news because they actually have a 24-hour local news channel, oh. which I think is cool. And I've actually, when I was a kid thinking up of that, when CNN became popular, I said, you know what, I think the next thing will happen is local channels will go 24 hours with the news. Because mm -hmm. if people, you know, if people like my dad or and their dads are watching the Weather Channel, they're going to definitely <laughs> want to watch local news 24 hours. Doesn't matter if they heard it for the fifth, sixth, or seventh time, they will still watch that. And apparently they said that they're highly rated over there. So I'm like, I believe you. I just want to believe that anybody who spends their time watching the Weather Channel lives in, I don't know, Kansas or lives in Tornado Alley or lives somewhere where – yeah, I live in San Diego, so weather is Perfect. a non-concern. <laughs> you know? I can't imagine watching the Weather Channel for entertainment. Are you familiar with the comedian Louis Black? Oh, I love Louis Black. Are you kidding? Have you ever heard him talk about the weather? Whoever does the weather for San Diego goes, they're getting six figures, and all they have to say is, oh – the weather's great. Back to you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Several of my friends are actually uh, chief meteorologists in San Diego, so I have no comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I work for. I've been working for a TV station in San Diego for 26 years now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I have to be careful what I say about no, that. No, no, that's fine. That, well, but yeah, we'll talk say, about your Lewis. easy that's job, Lewis. man. Come on. <laughs> Doing the forecast for San Diego. Well, today is sunny and 72, and let's look ahead to the six-day forecast. Well, it'll be sunny and 72 every day next week. <laughs> well, you got to realize that on our neck of the woods, when 2004 hit in Florida, and we had those four hurricanes, uh, and I have to explain people, because they didn't realize it, um, we got hit by four hurricanes five times because I think Gene hit us twice. It wow. actually hit us, went back into the Gulf, came back, and I'm sorry, went out in the Atlantic, came back, and hit us again. Was so, it the male Gene or the female Gene? Uh, it was the female Gene. I don't know. <laughs> it's not I was looking up at the hurricane going, mm, is that male or female? <laughs> you know how to tell the difference between a hurricane and a hemicane. No, it's by the way the clouds hang. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget your tape, your waitresses there. So when, so every year, NOAA, uh, the uh, NOAA came up and they said, yes, you're going to get hit with another hurricane. Yes, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So what is it now, 10, oh, 12 years later, we finally got Hurricane Matthew. And they finally, you know, and I've come up with a term called stormgasm. <laughs> I don't think I even need to define it. I think you understand what I'm talking about. Right? The the weather people go com completely nuts. They go uh, what I now have dubbed a verb is called Jim Cantor. Now they go completely Jim Cantor. They stand out in the middle of what is dangerous. 
they go out there, there's a big storm, and then they're almost blown over by the sign that they say, ah, don't be outside in this weather. I'm behind a tree now. That'll protect me from I'm here kidding. setting an example of exactly. what you shouldn't be doing. Exactly. And said, oh, ignore the car that's flying in the air. I'm about to impale me. But <laughs> that that's that was pretty much what um, Hurricane Matthew was. And, and um, as we said before, God, God bless everybody or – you know, we, we just have hopes and prayers for everybody from Haiti all the way up to the north. Uh, I think it was in the Carolinas that got hit by this. And um, we were in St. Augustine um, when it hit. And we were told by, and we were on vacation, and we were told by the manager of the hotel, get the hell out. You're not, you're not staying. And surely enough, we missed the flood by 12 hours. Wow, you're lucky. I, I wish uh, there had been a way for people in Haiti to have evacuated because they were just absolutely decimated. Yeah. The, the destruction down there is ungodly. I, I think they were just recovering from, I think, didn't they have an earthquake or something of that nature? Yeah, had... yeah just a couple of months back. So Haiti is really, really is hell, isn't it? I, so those poor people are just, you know, we, you know I, I, as far as I know, I was, I was joking to say that St. Augustine just opened a water park now for, for the next two days. <laughs> Unintentionally. Unintentionally, and you, if you ever seen the YouTube videos and stuff like that, but yeah, definitely areas like Haiti, we we were just like, gosh, I'm at, uh, I don't know when they're going to recover. Uh, St. Augustine's almost back up to normal, mm-hmm. from what I hear. But you know, oh, that's it's, good to know. Yeah, uh, guys, every, everybody who's, who suffers, you know, we 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 give them our very best, and hopefully they'll be up and running again and back to whatever their normal lives were. But. <laughs> On that note, I think I just buzz killed the whole episode. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I was just, in, uh, you know, just we're, we're, we're doing. Wow, what a bummer, man! Big Mine of... really brought me down. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, now I got to get high just to be happy again. Exactly. Are we? Are, oh yeah, we're doing an interview. Just in case you've just missed it, we are doing an interview with voice actor John St. John. Terrific oh, guy. Oh yeah, balls of steel. I almost <laughs> forgot. What you were doing. Yeah, come get some. I have that little sound bite before another hurricane comes for our stormgasm <laughs> out here. Now, there's also another game that I'm very interested in, but I it's the wrong sequel because I am a big fan of Twisted Metal, mm-hmm. but not Twisted Metal Four, which I have not seen. I was a Twisted Metal Black fan. Oh, and, yeah. And the one of the biggest reasons why is any video game that has Rolling Stone music in its in its theme. Well, you gotta love it. You gotta love it. You can't back out. <laughs> there, there, there's no denying it. Tell me a little bit about Twisted Metal Four and the history that you had over there. Well, Twisted Metal Four uh, was the one game that I refer to when people say how vocally stressful is video game work. So much so that now I was the uh, I'm all of the characters in that game pretty much except the chick <laughs> and uh, Sweet Metal, a uh, Sweet Tooth Spokes Clown. And that voice was akin to the, uh, remember uh, Tales from the Crypt on HBO? Oh, yeah. The Crypt Keeper? The Crypt Keeper. So it was me <laughs> kind of doing a takeoff of the Crypt Keeper, and that's a very vocally stressful gig. And after, you know, uh, that four- or five-hour recording session uh, that I did for, uh, I think it was Sony at the time, back in San Diego, I lost my voice for three or four days and uh, subsequently lost work and couldn't do any auditions for that three or four days. It was so vocally stressful. And uh, part of the reason why there's currently a, you know, a video game voice actor strike going on, too, is to protect our, you know, our rights and, 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 and you know, our, our voices, for that matter. But that game was uh, one of my favorites. And when it came out and I got copies and, and, and got my kids playing it when they were young, oh, they just loved it. That was the – they loved that more than they liked Duke Nukem. My kids were proud of the fact that it was all the voices in Twisted Metal 4. And uh, it was one of my favorite games to play too back when I still played because it's a driving, shooting kind of game. Yes. And and in the end, no matter whether you win or not, you lose because Sweet Tooth screwed you over when you got to make your wish at the end of the thing. You got screwed no matter what. Oh, you know what? I take it all back. I have seen – I've actually seen YouTube videos. I haven't played the game, uh-huh. but I, I remember the the endings where the yeah it wasn't only I think if I'm not mistaken and it was a while back I think not only does Sweet Tooth screw you but his his uh, spokes clown adds to the to the fire or something like that if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, like for instance, uh, General Warthog. 
Uh, General Warthog, you've won the Twisted Metal Challenge. What is it you desire? And General Warthog go, I want to command the greatest, uh, the biggest army in the world, whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, your wish is granted. And then you see this flashback sequence. And what happens is you're turned into a tiny little playground army, you know, thing in a yes. sandbox. And, oh, it's just ridiculous. You get your wish, but you get screwed at the same right. time. <laughs> and I think and I think if I'm mistaken, I don't know if you – Calypso is not in this one, right? Uh, yeah, Calypso was the name of the clown – oh, the guy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, going back to Duke, and I, I just, I'm just getting a mindset on things. Did you, could you even fathom how far and how well known and how great of a character, in my opinion, Duke would be, and and surviving even to the to, to day that he's not gone to obscurity, that people still remember that character. You know, I had absolutely no clue for years after I recorded the game, for years after it had been out. I had no idea that was it was any kind of cultural phenomenon. I I, I was clueless until uh, the first few offers for conventions came through, and and uh, the first one was a, a convention in Texas. They called me and said, "Oh my God, I can't believe we actually reached you. Uh, we've been trying to reach you for a couple of years to see if you'd come to our convention." I went, "Wow, yeah, I'd be happy to come to your convention." And, and I go to this first convention it was in Killeen, Texas. And it was actually an anime convention that also was trying to branch out in video games. And all of these soldiers from Fort Hood came to this convention because they heard Duke Nukem voice actor was going to be there. And I'm like, oh, my God, there are hundreds of people here who wanted to meet me. Why? They're huge fans of the game. And I had no idea that it had the following it did. And then the next thing I know, it's one convention invite after another. And then I've even traveled around the world to Australia, to, oh, to, to England, making these convention appearances. And, and I had no idea back then that the game was anything but just another video game. And um, I, I got to tell you, it changed. It literally changed my life. Duke Nukem changed my life. And uh, in, in an interview I was doing earlier today, a fellow asked me, he said, well, uh, the original Duke Nukem 3D game, how long did it take you to record all of that? And I went, oh, it was a regular you know, three- or four-hour shift. <laughs> and he said, that was it, four hours? And I said, well, you know, 25, 30 lines in the game maybe, you know, back then. And I said, there's four hours that changed my life. And he went, oh, dude, that's it. The four hours that changed my life. <laughs> and I'm going to remember that from now on. I think if I ever write my autobiography or whatever, it's going to be the four hours that changed my life. <laughs> It sounds like my prom night, <laughs> and not yeah, in the not in the good way either. <laughs> well, in, in good due fashion, I would have to say, "Lucky son of a bitch." <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and, and I got to tell you, I, I'm very, very, very lucky because had it not been for Duke Nukem and and my voice acting career taking off, I'd be stuck in a crappy broadcast radio job, being miserable somewhere. And you've, when did you start convention touring? Uh, I'm sorry, I think you said when it was. I think it was about 2004 was the first time I was invited. And, and though they'd been trying to get me for a couple of years before that, and I had no idea, these people were just lucky to have reached me. It, it's funny that some of the bigger cons, like uh, MAGFest in Washington, D.C., which I used to do every year, um, the, the fellow who was running that con just thought, well, it's a shot in the dark. There's no way in hell I'm going to get him, but I'm going to Facebook message this John St. John and see if I can get him interested in our convention. And I immediately answered and said, yeah, I'd love to come out. And he freaked out going, oh, my God, I reached out on Facebook and got this guy. And it's like, hell, if you just called me. <laughs> of course, my number is unlisted. But still, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm more than happy to, to go to conventions. I mean, they pay all my expenses, and I get to meet the fans. And to me... That's the coolest damn thing about my job and my life now is that I have fans around the world and I can go to a convention any month of the year and meet these people who just seem to love me unconditionally, though all I did was put a voice to a video game character. And, and I'm so blessed and so thankful that, that I have this going on in my life. I, I mean, it, it changed my life completely and, and, and I'm extremely pleased during that time frame there there seemed to be only two video games especially for the first person shooter that was doom and duke nukem doom was awesome mm -hmm. doom, doom was way ahead of its time 
But Duke Nukem took, I think, took it to another level. And the only way for it to have worked is with your voice and Duke's character. I think it, it was just like the cherry on top of a beautiful wedding cake. It was just a match made in heaven. Oh man, and that just that just makes me feel so so. I don't know, lucky, fortunate. I because I look at like like my favorite movie is The Incredibles. I just love that film, right? I cannot imagine any other voice being Mr. Incredible than Craig T. Nelson. He's perfect in the role. Right. Right? And people tell me, oh, well, your voice for Duke Nukem is perfect. I can't imagine any other voice for it. And I'm like, okay, uh, I guess. I, I mean, I'm so lucky to have, have landed such an iconic role, but I, I think that anybody or whoever had been cast for it would be in the position I'm in now where they'd be going, oh, my God, it wouldn't be the same without your voice. It could have been another voice actor, and you'd say the same thing to him today. I'm probably stepping back, and I'll probably be wrong, and I said I would probably disagree because Duke has a type of voice that I think not only people, I, I think for a better term, they, they, like myself, I said this was a character that I start emulating because Duke is fun and Duke is entertaining. And maybe somebody else could have taken it, but I think it would. I think you needed a John St. John to step in and put, because he has a not in a bad way where it's Christian Bale who sounds like he's been smoking thirty packs a day, but he <laughs> emulated that rough and toughness, and he came in at the right time in the mid '90s, mm -hmm. where the political correctness was not there, and he was fun. Yeah. And. It has to be John St. John. There may have been somebody else, but I, you know, we, I might be talking to somebody else at this time, but John St. John stepped into the thing, and I appreciate it. Oh, and well. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I, you know, when I was listening to Duke, I mean, after a while, I would be going around and trying to emulate that voice. So it might be a thing to say, yes, uh, somebody else could have stepped in, but I think for me, it's so wonderful that you took it because – you had the voice at the moment that I wanted to emulate and just walk around and talk, you know, when I, and when I talked to people, because it was so politically incorrect, but so much fun. <laughs> well, I got to say, I really lucked into that role. I mean, it was, it was all about timing and where I happened to be in San Diego at that time. Uh, you know, just, uh, the stars aligned and, and, and I'm the guy who got lucky enough to get that gig. It could have been anybody. It could have been somebody else. But I, I don't think they would have presented the character the same way I did. I think uh, having Lonnie Manella directing me saying, you know, Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry on steroids is really what you're shooting for. I think right. that's really what brought that voice uh, out of me. And um, I'm just, again, very, very fortunate to have been the guy who got the job of such an iconic character. Where could people find you? Where's your web presence at? Oh, well, I have my uh, my website. If you search for John St. John, and there's no H in my first name, right? J-O-N-S-T dot J-O-H-N. You'll find my website. And uh, that gives you not only uh, all of my demo reels, but links to uh, work I've done and to hire me for voiceover work or... Mm -hmm to hire me for convention appearances. Oh, there you go, guys. Anybody who's listening to this, you got a convention to run, or if you're looking for voiceover work, definitely John St. John. Also, you have an IMDB page as well. Yeah, though though I have very little to do with that one. I can't even edit that. Really? Because <laughs> yeah, I'm too cheap to pay for it. <laughs> I, I guess I could. But most of the information was correct. The only stuff they get wrong is somebody put uh, on one of these pages, I was born in Newport News, Virginia. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, no, I was born in California, <laughs> thank you. And sometimes I'm given credit for TV programs that I had absolutely nothing to do with. If it makes you feel better, I actually have one credit. I wrote for a cartoon called Dr. Stew, which was a fun little spinoff of Doctor Who. And uh -huh. And Family Guy. And now I just recently went back and said, you know, I haven't even checked my IMDb. What's going on with it? Apparently now I'm linked to a martial arts movie in Japan. <laughs> I am not kidding you. I, I was like, what? I can't even read the title. I mean, and apparently... What's with that? I don't, I don't get it. I don't even... And it's a bunch of voiceover people, and I'm in it. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Where's the movie? I just want to know where a part I come in. <laughs> sometimes they make no sense at all. I don't know who puts all this information out there, but wow, sometimes they just get it wrong. And and, and the fact that I can't go into like Wikipedia and change it back. Oh, Wiki, I can do. I take that back. But IMDb, I, I can't change that stuff. So I wish people would do a little more research before they, you know, edit pages about me. 
Oh, wow. No, that's okay. Uh, if you ever want to check out my martial arts movie, I'll send you the link. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do my that. voice Do that. is I in see it. it. Um, but other than that, um, John, thank you for so much for coming on to the show. And um, like I said, I... I am a big Duke Nukem fan, and forever, as the um, pun intended, will be, I will be. If he keeps going, I hope I hear, get to see you again. I hope to get to see you soon at a convention down here in Florida. Well, hail to the king, baby. Awesome. Thanks, John. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. So, yeah, the damn scene in the sub, it's like you kept, you had to swim underneath, but if you stayed under there for more than, like, 30 seconds... You would you die. Funny? You would die because you would run out of breath. And I'm like, I can hold my breath for like more than 30 seconds, and I'm a 98 pound weakling. You know? Yeah, but how deep are you though? How deep are you? Like, are no, you being not at all. Right you're, you're you're in a submarine. You're just literally going down and turning the valves. So it's, so, it's, uh, oh, it's a, but anyway. So anyway, all right, all right, guys. So we're back. Um, yes. So uh, just give us just give it a year. The 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 short version of, of Duke Nukem. Um, Oh gosh. So, uh, so what do you got uh, going on th- on Thanksgiving? So this is our Thanksgiving uh, episode. This is our Thanksgiving episode. Okay, so um, I guess I'm masochistic a little bit, and uh, I'm going to be taking all three of my children along with a dog and driving down to North Carolina from uh, my location, and which is a mystery. Yeah, I'm not telling you. Google. Oh uh, yeah. So we're going to be driving all the way down there to um, have Thanksgiving with a cousin that I haven't seen apparently since. <laughs> I was like eight, um, but my mother messaged me on Facebook and said that I had to do this. So I'm driving. I'm driving. I don't know how my mother has that much power over me um, from six different states away from me, but yeah. here we are. Uh, this is going to be awkward. Like, I'm not prepared for this. I'm going to arrive. And I was like, hello, cousin, new person staying in your house. And apparently we've met. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> so... Uh. That's gonna pretty be fun. Crazy. Yeah, pretty crazy, crazy indeed. Yeah, like I said, I always, I always work on uh, Thanksgiving because it's just, it's, it's extra holiday money uh, for me. So, and it's actually kind of nice. Uh, the parks usually pretty nice too. So, um, yeah, oh, so I you're have... pimping, you're pimping on, on, on Thanksgiving. You sh- no, I'm, no, you should be ashamed I'm, of yourself. I, I am performing, and uh, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. But. Uh, Hey, like I said, for those of you out there, uh, our listeners, uh, listen, by all means, please have a great and safe Thanksgiving. Come up in the future, I will be at uh, the, if you're here in Orlando area, I'll be at Spooky Empire, uh, December uh, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, that weekend, if you're in Orlando. And then after that, uh, myself and Mark and uh, also uh, Zion, we will be at Paradise City in Fort Lauderdale for that convention. And that one is going to be a fantastic show. It's part of the Supercon family. Uh, we're going to be doing a. Uh, doing several panels which uh, are to be announced it's got some fantastic guests and uh, it's just really just gonna be a uh, gonna be a total blast cosmic blast i mean flash gordon and dr buckaroo bonsai are gonna be there and uh, some guy named arthur uh Darverell or something i don't know i think he had something to do with dr who but uh, something i don't mm-mm. no i think he was a good guy yeah mm-hmm. i think i was something about it right something so. like that yeah so, oh, that's Pastor right. Yeah, or something. he was he was he was he was Rip Hunter in Legends of Tomorrow. <laughs> he was also a pastor. These are facts, people. These are facts. These are facts. Reverend Paul Church. Uh, that was, was I didn't <laughs> Reverend see Reverend Pro- I, <laughs> I didn't see Broadchurch. Was he the killer? Oh no no no! Don't tell me! Don't tell me! Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well you guys enjoy your food coma be safe well means keep listening uh spread love uh like and share like i said we're on facebook we're on twitter uh we got the website uh either marco 42 legend of the traveling tardis let's be reals and uh when i eventually get back to it i'll start up my old site again so all right folks have a great and safe holiday and take care bye-bye bye-bye Marku 42 was written and presented by Mark Baumgarten, Christian Basil, Diggy Matthews, and Patty Hawkins. This episode was edited, directed, and produced by Mark Baumgarten. Visit Marku42.net where you can register and become part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at marku42, subject line, question mark. 
If you'd like a chance to be a guest on our radio show, send an email to our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. You can have Marku42 entertain at your next event or convention. Go to heroesonhand.com slash marku42. Base Coast Comics is a free monthly magazine found in over 120 locations currently throughout Brevard County, parts of Osceola, Belusia, and Indian River County in Florida, and soon to be available in Chicago. Follow them on Facebook to learn more. Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. This show is owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2016. This is Krypton Radio.